after I applied to be like a, a trainer there, they said like, you know, you did well with the interview, unfortunately, because you don't have a degree. And it just kind of like, kind of like got into my head. I was like, oh my gosh, this degree, like I am not going to let this stop me. And so I had nothing to lose. So I just told them that, okay, let's do it this way. It was a risk for me to do it, but I just had to do it because I wanted to show them that I can do it even without a degree. So I told the person who was interviewing me that there's a six months probationary program, right? So hire me, give me the salary of an agent, but give me the work of the trainer. And the salary difference is huge. But I just wanted to prove a point that I can do this. And then I said that after six months, if I do not pass the trainer's evaluation, it's still okay for you because you can still hire me and continue with my salary as an agent. But if I pass the evaluation period, then you just need to adjust and you know switch my role to become a trainer. I said, it's a win-win situation for you. And that was a risk for me to, to say, but if I'm going to make this strategic move to enter this space, it was a global company. That's why I wanted to gain that you know, experience from them because I knew I was going to learn a lot. And then they hired me. And thank God, after six months, <laughs> I passed the evaluation. And I'm grateful for them giving me that opportunity to just jump in and for them for you know, taking a chance on me. Yeah. And that's how everything just sort of like rolled into in opening different opportunities also. Hello everyone, my name is Dean Long and welcome to the podcast Lifeline. In this podcast, I will interview people who are having a positive impact in their community and have a strong message that deserves to be shared. We will dive deeper into their journey becoming a change maker and hopefully you can take away some insights for your own journey. And please do subscribe to Lifeline on YouTube, Apple Podcasts or any platform that you are using. And also you can share this episode with your friends if you like it. It's really what helps me the most. In today's episode, you will meet Carla Mumar, who is serving underserved students in the Philippines to help them develop a growth mindset and their grit so they can find a purpose and unleash their potential. Carla always believes that she could have a fulfilling life without taking all the boxes and wanted to prove she could be a successful person without a university degree. She started her career as a call center agent and then created her own curriculum to self-learn all the skills she needed to climb the corporate ladder and stand out in the job market. While she faced countless rejections, her hacker mindset and grit, which is a passion and perseverance in service of a long-term goal, eventually led her to become a trainer and then founder of Scale Solutions to bring everything she has learned back to the community. She shared how her life is an ongoing test and trial, where every job and experience was an opportunity to refine her purpose, which is to equip the marginalized youth with the skills they need to succeed and achieve their dreams. We discussed the unexpected start of Scale Solutions, her mental health and well-being routine, and explore her hacker mindset. I'm sure you will love this episode, so see you in two hours if you like this episode i would love to hear some of your feedback so feel free to send me a message feel free to send a message to carla as well and of course you can share to one or two of your friends enjoy and see you soon hi carla hi salamat po <laughs> <laughs> hi Cool. So I'm super, super glad to be recording this episode with you. And I always start with some random introduction where I introduce a bit, uh, like how we know each other, mm -hmm. what I know about you, et cetera, et cetera. So mm -hmm. basically, um, well, I just said that to you like two minutes ago, but let's put for the sake of the listener. Uh, yeah. So uh, Linka, uh, which is... 
actually recommending me a lot of guests. So Linka interviewed her on episode 125. And yeah, she recommended me when she met you during a meeting. So she was super excited. She shared with me like dozens of messages about, okay, you have to interview Carla. And I think what, what re like really convinced her is when she saw that you were speaking about grit because Linka is a huge, huge, huge fan of grit. Mm -hmm. Um so and me too yeah i like the models and i started to uh so i started this long journey trying to stalk you online which is very <laughs> difficult <laughs> to be honest <laughs> oh my god it's so hard to stalk you <laughs> maybe we can speak about it later yeah. I, I, but um yeah i could find your linkedin it took me a lot of time to find your instagram Mm. To realize that there is nothing much on your Instagram. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, was, I was like, oh, okay, there is nothing. Uh, but I found it, actually. So I'm happy. I found a few articles that you wrote, but I mainly found your work with Scale, with the mm. Clamazon, and obviously mm. your LinkedIn profile. Yeah. Um, anyway, that was a, a lot of random stuff. But yeah, maybe let's kickstart. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself what you are doing these days where you mm -hmm. are or just you know anything that you want to share to kickstart with okay yeah um i i'm you know th thank you so much then long for you know having me on your podcast uh and for linka for connecting us uh it's it's a pleasure to you know be on here and uh hello to all your listeners you know whichever time zone you're in good morning good afternoon or good evening um, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to like do like a whole uh, very long uh, intro about myself, uh, but my name is Carla Mumar. I am from the Philippines and uh, from and currently based in the Philippines. And um, I have a startup called Scale Solutions, uh, which we focus on empowering the underserved, um, you know, through disrupting education, taking climate action and protecting human rights. Um, I'm also uh, um, part of a, uh, a start, another startup called Workbase, which is uh, sprouted um, because of the, the need for employment, remote employment for, you know, for, for Filipinos. Uh, and um, we're focusing on building the gig um, economy in the Philippines and really providing more jobs to more than 4 million Filipinos who have lost uh, employment uh, since the start of the pandemic. Um, so I, I guess, yeah, I'm very passionate about grit and growth mindset. Uh, those are two of my core um, uh, advocacies also um, in really helping people understand and apply grit and also uh, putting their minds around what growth mindset and innovation is. So that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> cool thank you so much Carla and yeah we'll have time to go through everything that you mentioned and even mm -hmm. more um, I what I like to do is also to, to share uh, a bit like how people describe themselves on LinkedIn as well so what I found is <laughs> all these you know cool keywords so uh, entrepreneur sustainability circular economy ideation architect 36 times 36 fellow mm -hmm. operation strategies and i saw on your instagram that you also tagged an art gallery <laughs> so <maybe laughs> if it has a, a link with you i don't know yet but let's <laughs> let's see um so what i uh, like to do with this podcast is to uh start in a chronological order so mm -hmm. you know from well not not from the moment you were born but yeah just starting you know like if you could share you know uh where did you grow up how was your mm. any childhood memories that you mm. know yeah. either relate or don't relate to whatever you are doing uh today and i also saw very interestingly because i was wondering what did you study before i saw that you studied speech communication and theater arts <laughs> Which is very interesting. <laughs> so yeah, maybe yeah, could you share a bit about your childhood? Like Yeah. Um, well, I I grew up in a single parent home. So my mother uh brought us up uh single handedly. Um and um I have two brothers, uh, an older one and a younger one. And um so the three of us uh plus my mother were 
the ones who were, you know, going through life, as we call it. Um, and uh, let's say my childhood was, uh, I think it's a very typical um, single parent, you know, home. Um, we're in, for me, that was normal to have one parent at home, both working and taking care of us. Um, and I think a lot of also, um, like my my passions and advocacies uh, and work ethic really comes from how I saw my mother, uh, how she re- really raised us. So, um, so with with that, I, I you know I really want to honor her for for ensuring that you know her children uh, sees you know how she she does her her um her work you know and her values uh so my values and and really mission oriented type of mindset uh really come from her um in terms of like student life i'm very uh what do you call this i'm not your typical a student <laughs> Uh, I was very, I was very active in school, but I was also very uh, troublesome. <laughs> so I, I was not, you know, the the typical student. Um, uh, or what most parents would wish that, oh, there's an A student, you know, and active in every in all extracurricular activities. Um, I had my ups and downs as a student, uh, but and I think. Going through that kind of uh, um, childhood or up to like you know um, my college years uh, really put a chip on my shoulder, which I think that allowed me to always keep that balance and keep things in check. Uh, that um, that I that I don't know everything, you know. I think that's one of the things that I appreciate with that kind of um uh you know my growing up years uh it's not that you know oh i have it all i know it all because you know i wasn't that honor student or i wasn't that perfect student and i'm not perfect on paper um it it allowed me to explore uh all my the different um uh, abilities and also all the different uh, ways that I could maximize um, the skills that I have in order for me to grow and to uh, really jump off um, my my professional life. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> and do you remember, like if you had any childhood dreams or like, okay, when I'm older, I want to yeah. do this or that? I think um, okay, when I was a kid, I initially wanted to be um, a lawyer. Um, but I was when I found out that you had to read so much books, I was like, <laughs> ah, no, 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 thank you. Because um, like, I, I never liked reading books. Like I remember... Um, people would gift me so many books and I'd never open them. Um, so like, and then I decided I wanted to be like a, a news anchor, um, like a, a, a field, you know, um, correspondent, you know. Um, but then like, I decided that, oh, like um, maybe I, I, you know, opt to do something else. Maybe like I do film so I think the the last thing that I wanted to do was uh, make films, um, like direct films, uh, write uh, scripts. Um, and I think up to a certain extent, I kind of did that when I was in college, uh, did a few indie films, you know, for projects. Um, and sort of applied a few of the methodologies, uh, even at the private sector when I started working. Um, but yeah, I think those those dreams when I was a kid, I, uh, it sort of like evolved and kind of in in a funny way, it kind of mixed things uh, together. 
interesting because I guess, well, you you will, I guess you will share how you ended up studying speech mm. communication and CRO. Also, but in CRO, I guess you also need to read a lot of <laughs> scripts and even learn them, right? <laughs> yeah, um, I guess like I, so I, I, I ended up with speech communication uh, and also eventually in, in communications um, is that I, I didn't really want to go to college uh, because I was working, um, I, I was working for a, a radio station at that time and And I, you know, I just didn't feel like going to school. I was a, I was such, a, I was a kind of like rebellious. Um, so I was like, uh, if if going to school uh, means is like you're just gonna, you know, get a job, then you know, well, I have something that I'm doing. So, um, you know, I that's why I was kind of like um, trying to navigate. What do I really want? You know, so even when I took that course, I wasn't sure that I wanted it. Um, but I knew that it's something that I could do. Um, speech communication and theater arts. Uh, I mean, I, I love the theater. Um, I was involved in, you know, theater even back in high school. Um, speech communications, because I, I do love to, like, speak, like, like have a... Like I joined like declamation contests and stuff, and I so I said like that's the easiest route to enter this this university because I I I was so stubborn, and I think a lot of young people would will relate to this that um, I was so stubborn that I decided not to apply to any school in the Philippines um, right after college. Uh, So and then, and then so when I finally did apply um, after much discussion uh, with my with my mom, um, I, I took in the a course that wasn't such a high demand. They call it non coda courses, so it was easier for me to to enter. So I I, um, I went to to that school and um, just started to try it out uh, for like a two and a half years. I was there, yeah. So actually, when you mentioned you wanted, you know, to be a news anchor, you actually tried through working at the radio station. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a FM radio station, so it was more of like you know playing music and you know, talking about okay. artists and stuff. Um, uh, I mean, the closest to like real news would be like. If we would talk, um, announce a few things about commercials or, you know, things like that, um, or like showbiz, showbiz news and stuff. <laughs> um, that's the closest. But I, I think it was just um, even growing up, and you know, I, I do want to encourage young people that all of these different dreams or aspirations, even when you're, you know, uh, super young, a lot of this evolve into something and they merge. And you won't actually realize it all until um, you become older. So I'm already, in, you know, 40 years old, and there are still things that I'm discovering about things that I've wanted when I was, you know, younger. What I wanted to get into, or the skills and the talents I had that I didn't even realize I was applying to the things that I'm doing today. Um, And it comes in waves. It comes in, you know, patterns and seasons. Uh, how you use it, how you're able to apply it. So it's pretty interesting. Mm. What do you? Because yeah, I mean, it's uh, yeah, I really love what you said because it's yeah, really something I really believe in as well. I'm, I'm sure you have seen the connect the dots backwards speech from Steve Jobs. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, yeah, it's really, it's really this. You don't know what's going on actually until you look back and you're like, okay, actually this, even if it had nothing to do, mm -hmm. actually brought me to where I am today. Yeah. Um, and very interesting. Like, do you, do you think that you, I mean, because you mentioned a few times you were like very rebellious and stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Are you still? I think um, like if I define like me being a rebel today, it's more of like me challenging myself and challenging people to think outside of the box, to take that leap of faith, to take that risk, um, to to like live the life that they want to live, to um, to fulfill whatever their dreams are without even without thinking so much of what they do not have because i think like we we all grew up in a society where in everyone boxed us up that you can only do this you can only dream this um if you tick all of these boxes in your checklist but um so for me i am rebellious in a way that i don't need that checklist I can go and do what I know I am called to do, what my purpose is, and actually live it without checking all of these boxes. Um, whatever it is, if it's my personal list, if it's you know society's list, I don't need to conform to that in order for me to fulfill my destiny. And I, knew, I wish I knew it sooner than later. Um, I think that I would have been more Uh, confident in myself, I would have believed in myself more um, if I had that mindset when I was much younger. Unfortunately, you know, society really dictates a lot of things. Even in the times of our parents, you know, there's just a lot of um, tr very traditional, uh, you know, uh, ways or th that people were sort of brought up into without having that choice. So that's my kind of uh, re rebellious, uh, you know, if, if you'd like to call it like that. Yeah, yeah, I really love it. I feel like it's still, it's still, I well, you still had this rebellious behavior quite young. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, from what I understood is you had this behavior, rebellious, re re uh, wait. Re rebellious behavior <laughs> quite young but realized it later mm. right yeah yeah when, um I, yeah go yeah, ahead when, yeah. when do you think you realized it or you became proud of it i think it's you know um like when when you think about a rebel we always think it's it's very negative right and of course because there's a lot of actions or you know specific um behaviors of uh, a person labeled as rebellious that are very destructive and like i've had my share of you know craziness when i was younger but i think like with me personally i really believe that um because like my mom always uh really uh, taught us about you know values and also faith and you know um and making sure that uh you know we are centered with our faith like you know in, in god that that she always said that you know um bad things can turn into good so like you know whatever situation that you have encountered or you've experienced in your life god can always flip it around and turn it into good And so for me, whatever higher power you believe in, I believe that um, that that's that's also that's really true. That like for me, my rebellious streak when I was younger, you know, I, I know in my heart that, you know, God really switched it around so that I could use it to like help bring my self confidence up. And he just sort of like aligned it to my values and so that i'll be more it's more on the positive you know spectrum now versus the negative uh spectrum so it became more about confidence it's about you know being able to uh push and and move forward with whatever dreams or you know goals that i have be able to take risks um to be able to you know um believe that anything is possible um, regardless of what you have or what you do not have so it's it's getting rid of that limit um, so anything is possible it means that 
there's no limit until you set that limit for yourself. Mm, I really, really like it. Um, no, I think it's so important to know that. As, I mean, to... Because I, re I really, yeah, I really feel what you said in terms of, you know, you don't need this checklist box mm. to feel fulfilled. You don't yeah. need to, you know, be dictated by the pressure of society mm. or your peers. Yeah. I just wonder, like, I felt like, I don't know, you know, I meet so many people Mm -hmm. Whereas they are 15, 25, 40. But if mm -hmm. we focus on the younger age, yeah. I've met so many people who, you know, they, I don't know, they want to work in an NGO, they want to study art, they want to do things that, you know, are not considered in that checklist by yeah. society, yeah. but also by parents in general. Mm -hmm. So yeah. then, you know, they, There, there is a big clash between you know, generation and mm -hmm. the parents. So I just wonder in your case, mm -hmm. you mentioned you had this chat with your mom, but is it something that your mom supported you with to, you know, be think, really think and, and, you know, live outside of the box or is it something you had to convince her? I think my mom was very, you know, I think uh, she like parents, especially Filipino parents would always say that, you know, if, Uh, when you get a job, you know, it's, it's, you look for stability, um, especially, you know, I'm not living at home. Uh, you know, she said that make sure it's, you know, something stable. You need something that's stable because you need to earn, right? I mean, uh, you know, reality is that we need money to pay for things, you know, to, to make sure that, you know, we pay for rent, we pay for food and all that other stuff. Um I think like because I was still trying to figure out what I wanted. So like I had so many different jobs. Uh, some of them I just jumped into because I moved out, you know, at a young age. Well, for the Philippines, it's it's kind of young. It's not normal for especially girls to just move out. So I moved out. I was 20. Um, and then I just started to look for a job. Uh, um, and it was like, It, initially, it was a necessity for me to find a job so that I could, you know, uh, pay the bills. Um, I didn't know exactly what I wanted. I didn't have a a clear plan of what's going to be my professional career, and 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 I, it sort of evolved. So, like, I started in business, you know, BPOs or like call centers, and then I got into training and development, and then. I got to operations and HR and it sort of evolved gathering all of these things. And, and, and to let you know, I, I didn't finish college then long. I didn't finish college because I just decided like, Oh my God, I'm done. <laughs> like, um, uh, and, and I mean, it's not something that I would advise, you know, young people to do like, you know, just quit school. Um, I had to go through a lot of like, you know, hoops uh, so that I can figure out my way. And this was my journey. Um, it was not an easy journey, but it led to like uh, self-discovery, but it was a very rough terrain. It was a, it was, if you think of like, there's just so many storms, it was like storms like back to back. Um, but Uh, that self-discovery led me to where I am today. And I'm still discovering a lot of things. Um, I never like thought that I would be where I am today. I never thought of myself as someone who would, you know, uh, thrive in, you know, the corporate setting or in the private sector. I always thought that, oh, I will be in the arts because I was really into art the arts when I was younger. I painted a lot. I did, you know, theater. I love music. Uh, I played the piano. Um, I was also into sports, but um, so like even like some of like my friends that I haven't seen in a long time and they find out what I'm doing now. It's like, huh? You know, <laughs> um, they never, no one has ever imagined uh, that I would be doing what I'm doing today. Um, So, and that's all part of 
you know, discovering yourself. And like, I've made, you know, tough, you know, decisions, wrong decisions, learned from them, you know, picked myself up and then, you know, just kept moving forward and take, you know, took all those learnings uh, from every experience that I've had, the good and the bad, um, to really bring me to where I am today. And without all of those, without even the people, you know, uh, who, who I've, I've had, like, both good and bad experiences, uh, situations, the good and the bad, all contribute to your self-discovery. And it's all a part of your story. Um so I think that if there's one thing that my mom really helped me, it wasn't about what career to choose or what job to take. It was how, how do you remain uh, you know, steadfast with your values? With, how do you remain steadfast with the character that, you know, that's building as you grow? And how do you remain you know, uh, centered in your faith? And I think without that kind of stability from my mom, you know, my family, uh, you know, my mom and my two brothers, really, that I don't think I don't think I will be where I am today also because they helped me um, go back to, you know, the center, regardless of which, you know, experience I am sort of like getting out of. Uh, or experiencing at the moment. So that's the kind of support uh, that I've had with my family. It's not always easy to listen to advice from family, um, especially when you know they're right and you're wrong. But uh, that's how my mom and my brothers have really helped me steer, you know, to be in the right direction. Mm, oh my God, it's... So many questions I have in my mind now. <laughs> Just go ahead. Everything you I'll try to answer them. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's so cool. It's like your family is your GPS. Or yeah. like your map. Wherever yeah. you go, they are here to show you what is the right direction. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the that's the thing. Like when you said GPS, it's like even there's a map, you know, a GPS. We sometimes also choose not to follow it. And I've had that you know, I've made those decisions sometimes that I choose mm. not to follow, you know, their advice. Um, you know, that's the stubborn side of me. And the thing is, I, I also believe that you will always learn, um, go through the same cycle until you learn your lesson. Um, and, and, and I've seen that in my life, like going through the same cycle. And it, it's not just about your professional career. It can also be in any kind of relationships you've had. Um, life, you know, as we know it, like it's the same cycle until you learn your lesson. Um, it's going to be the same cycle until you're able to move up and step forward and pick yourself up. Um, you know, I, I, I do believe that... Uh, all of us, whatever whatever situation we're in right now, there's always something that uh, we're supposed to learn from, and and there's always also people that are placed in within our radar that we're supposed to help. Whether we listen to them, whether we um, support them in 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 whatever way we can. But um, but it's that cycle, and then you could you 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 continue to stay on that cycle until you fulfill what you're supposed to learn and what you're supposed to do. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I really no, I really agree because I feel like you know, in your case, or I think in general, like sometimes, even if even if we might know that the other person is correct sometimes it's good that sometimes we need to go through i mean wait so we need to experience a mistake or we need to experience the experience first yeah. or realize it's a mistake by ourselves one yeah. time two times three times yeah or just try to make sure that it's not a mistake before we actually go back to the same i mean to the whatever path 
uh, which is waiting for us. Yeah. But yeah, totally agree. It's a great point. And, and, and yeah, I think I feel like, I feel like the, I don't know, I wanted to come back on, on what you mentioned when you dropped out of college. Mm-hmm, I feel like yeah. it's, uh, yeah, I wonder like, like why, what's the context? How did mm-hmm. you take that decision? Is it mm-hmm. in the end, was it a good decision as well? Did you always see it as a good decision? Mm-hmm. Um, I dropped out of college because uh, there was. I decided to. I moved out of um, my mom's house, and you know, I, I decided that I just wanted to, like, you know, l- live, you know, a, a different life. Like, I wanted to just start working and all of that. And you know, of course, as a parent, you know, um, it's like, you know, they their rules. <laughs> And um, and I decided that no, I, I'm I just I'm gonna I want to move out. You know that was the rebel, you know, rebellious side of me. Um, so yeah, I, I moved out and just made that decision. So I dropped out of school, um, and just tried to figure things out because, um, you know, and later on in in my life, I I found out why I didn't really like school because, uh, later on I found out because there were certain types of trauma that I've had that I didn't even realize that it was trauma uh, like in, that happened in school. Um, trauma in terms of like, you know, learning and stuff. Like, for example, I only found out I had a learning disability when it comes to math numbers, which is called dyscalculia. Uh, I only found out like four years ago. So that was such a big trigger for me um, for in school. So I didn't like um, I didn't like you know just learning in that kind of setting. I also wanted to experience things. Um, I did not learn through just reading books and having these tests. Um, I was looking for something more because I knew that. Um, that I can do things, but I did not feel I was thriving in school, probably because of how uh, education is really traditionally set up. It's there are different types of learners. And it just so happened that the way I was being taught was not really working for me. It was making me more demotivated, making me more feel inferior. Um, that's why one of the core programs that I have uh, at scale is disrupting education. So meaning for, for students who do not have access to like uh, what I call leapfrogging um, education or learning or skills um, due to lack of resources and opportunity, I, I put that you know, um, in, in, in as part of something that they can have access to. Um, so like, I, I did, I did not see how I was going to thrive, um, in a very, uh, traditional way of learning. Cause I was, I wasn't learning that way. My brain just could not, uh, capture the things that was being taught to me. So I decided to just take my learning to real life because that's how I see myself learning, like real life application, figuring things out, learning to strategize, you know, with real um, problems and situations. Um, I basically tried to create my own curriculum for myself to learn um, the way that I can learn. And nowadays, there are new schools starting to do that, even as young as preschool. Um, you know, introducing new ways of learning and really introducing, you know, the different types of learners, uh, you know, in, in, in schools. But um, there's still, like, you know, a need for it. And also, I wanted to to prove a point that you know, in reality, one does not really need, you know, a college degree to be successful. A college degree does not equate to success. 
um, even now you're seeing there are courses that are shorter. Um, even like larger companies don't focus on your degree. They focus on the skill and your values. Um, and that's what, we're give, that's what we call disrupting education. It's focusing on the core skills that are needed for you to thrive, you know, professionally. And I, I experimented that, you know, with myself, um, you know, just trying to build my own curriculum. And I know I'm blabbing, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure you have a couple of questions and I can elaborate. Well, yeah, I have one million questions. It's so interesting. <laughs> Let's, I don't know where to start. Uh, but I think with, uh, yes, let, let's start with that. When you, you know, I really like when you say you've established your own curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, like, it, uh, like, did you do that, you know, once you dropped out or is it something you've done? I don't know. Yeah, could you, yeah. Could you share yeah. a bit more about that? So when I dropped out, Uh, that's when, of course, I moved out of the house. And of course, I had to, uh, I, I actually lived with a friend for a bit. And the, the first job that I got was in a, you know, in a call center. And, um, and of course, I did not want to answer phones forever because I'm not very good at it. Uh, I'm not a very, you know, I don't have long patience in, you know, uh, taking the concerns of, Of people who are calling. So, and then I looked at the industry and I looked at, okay, if I'm going to stay here in this industry for a while, which area would I want to be in or which department? And I looked at training. So I started reading books. So for the young listeners out there, you know, during my time, the internet wasn't like, uh, I mean, there was internet, but it wasn't like, you know, that everyone has internet anytime, anywhere, you know. Um, so I would go to bookstores um, and read books on, on training and development, human resources, leadership and development, uh, corporate training. And these books were very expensive, so I don't buy them. I was earning, like, really such a low income at that time. Um, that I couldn't afford buying, you know, $30 or $40 books. Um, and so I was reading it and then leaving like a piece of paper as a bookmark, hiding the books, you know, in the bookshelves in the bookstore. And I would take notes, right? I would take notes um, and then I'd come back the next day. For months at a time, I would do that every day. That's how I basically focused on a skill that I knew would help me thrive in the career I was in. So, um, and then I asked uh, some, some friends who were like managers uh, in the call center industry to introduce me to people uh, that they work with who were trainers, who were, you know, senior leaders in, in, in the call center industry, you know, um, just so that I could, you know, pick their brain and just, you know, learn about stuff uh, about them and maybe get some advice. Um, so that's how I built it. That's how I built my curriculum. And then it slowly flourished and, and evolved uh, into, you know, just really understanding what I wanted to do with my career. I did not want to be Um, in the BPO industry for, you know, for, for a very, very long time, though a big chunk of my professional career uh, was in the BPO industry. And that's where I sort of like learned a lot of fundamental skills in terms of corporate, you know, the private sector. Um, yeah, so that's how I sort of like wiggled my way through, you know, disrupting my education <laughs> Wow, and 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 then like like how do you once you learn all of this? How do you let's say market it? That's the right word. But how do you you know show to people that okay, I've learned these skills, I can do yeah. this and that. You just apply. Like I just like after six months in my like my first job uh, as an agent in the call center, like. 
I just applied, you know, to be like a trainer and I got rejected so many times. And I was like, no, I want to be a trainer. So I'm going to look for a company that's going to hire me as a trainer, even without any experience. So then I moved to a different industry, um, which was an online English teaching, and they were looking for a trainer. All you needed to be good at is to be able to speak, you know, good English with a neutral accent. And I said, I can do that. <laughs> so, um, so I applied. I applied to like so many different companies and I got like rejected because I didn't finish college. I didn't have an experience, but I was just very persistent. That's grit. Um, you know, the long-term persistence. I wasn't going to let my future be dictated with um, uh, whether I had a diploma or not. I, I believe in my heart that that was not the only way for me to be successful. I mean, the likes of Steve Jobs, the likes of, um, uh, what do you call this, of... Um, uh, oh my gosh, I forgot his name. Mark uh, Zuckerberg. Yeah, Mark Maybe. Zuckerberg, right? <laughs> um, they they didn't finish college uh, and look at where they're at today. Like, um, it's just that for some people, finishing college is works for them. That's how that's how their you know the desk like that's how their plan was meant to be. But with me, I guess it was just because also of my choices. It, I, it didn't feel that it would fit the way I needed it to be. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, and, and as soon as, you know, I got, you know, this other job. So I just left that industry, the call center industry, stayed for this, you know, other company um, for uh, over a year and then. I had a strategy. I had to move back to the BPO industry, but I wanted to be in a in a bigger, you know, company to get more experience. Um, and one thing that I did, uh, I'm just sort of fast tracking, you know, a couple of things here. But I think one thing I did is like when, again, like after I, I applied for, um, you know, to be like a, a trainer there, and they said, like, you know, you did well with the interview, unfortunately, because you don't have a degree. And it just kind of like, kind of like got into my head. I was like, oh, my gosh, this degree, like, I am not going to let this stop me. Um, and so I, I had nothing to lose. So I just told them that, OK, let's do it this way. It was a risk for me to do it, but I just had to do it because I... I wanted to show them that I can do it even without a degree. So I told um, the person who was interviewing me that um, there's a six months probationary program, right? So hire me, give me the salary of an agent, and but give me the work of the trainer. Um, and then Whoa. if I do not pass, and the salary difference is huge. But I just wanted to prove a point that I can do this. Um, and then I said that after six months, if I do not pass the trainer's evaluation, it's still okay for you because you can still hire me and continue you know, with my salary as an agent. But if I pass you know, um, your, you know, the scorecard, you know, the, the evaluation period, then you just need to adjust and you know switch my role to become a trainer. I said it's a it's a it's a really win you're it's you're a win-win situation for you. Um and that was a risk for me to to say, but I wanted to it was like for me, if I'm gonna make this strategic move to enter this space, um because it was it was a larger company. It was a global, you know, uh, uh, company. That's why I wanted to gain that, you know, experience from them because I knew I was going to learn a lot. And then they hired me. And thank God, after six months, <laughs> I passed the evaluation. So, and I'm grateful for, for them being, you know, to giving me that opportunity to just uh, jump in 
uh, and for them for you know giving me you know get, taking a chance on me yeah and that's how everything just sort of like rolled into in opening different uh, opportunities also wow i love how you you use the word disrupt but for me i love how you hack the system <laughs> it's really hacking it i really love it i think like when you're when you're kind of it, it's I, i think grit is it's a mix of like persistence and desperation and necessity um and your passion all of those components kind of you know steer where you're going where you're going to focus your mind and your energy into in order for you to achieve you know both your short term and long term goals at that time i i had no idea if you know i would remain in the bpo industry for a long time And lo and behold, I did not. You know, after a couple of years, uh, I I moved into the tech industry. Like my roles shifted, um, and now I'm <laughs> like I'm in scale. Like even like when I was in the tech industry, I I didn't even know that I would be in a tech industry. Uh, it was it was crazy, but it was an opportunity that I. I was willing to try out, and um, I think if you want to be very agile in life or in your career, um, you have to be able to pivot immediately. You have to be able to um, look at yourself and not get stuck to um, rapid changes in your life, because. That's the only way for you to be very progressive, um, especially in your mind. Uh, you know, that's really about growth mindset. Also, um, I, I think that one of the things that I learned about myself is that I am I am more than okay to learn something new, you know, versus not not learn it at all. I am okay. More than okay to take on a challenge, to take in a new role that I have no experience in, because I know if I focus, and you know I really put in all the effort, and I'm very determined that I can make it happen. So you know that's something that you know I want to encourage you know your listeners, you know to do. You just you just need to take that that leap of faith. You just You need to believe in yourself, but you also need to have that, like, healthy level of fear that will make you want to do whatever it takes to get things done, to achieve your goal, to to make sure that you are able to fulfill your purpose. And I blabbed again. <laughs> no, no, no! I love it. No, 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 no worries. Uh, how, how do you? I mean, in general, people. How can people? And I guess it's what you do with scale solutions. But how mm-hmm. do? How can people train their brain to? Because you know everything you mention. I think not only. I mean, it requires a lot of. Uh, or I mean, a lot of skills, but also a specific mindset to have. Mm-hmm. I yeah. guess you know at the origin, like how 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 do you train, or how can people you know train themselves to, you know, at least develop this mindset of okay, test and trial, test and trial, reinventing myself, starting something from scratch where I don't know anything, but I, I will try my best to to you know to make it work. Yeah, I think it's. Like for me, it wasn't a walk in the park. It's really um, you have to be very uh, deliberate. Um, you have to be very deliberate in with your actions, with what you think. Um, one of my good friends and also mentors always reminded me that, "Hey, Carla, you control the world by controlling yourself," um, because. That's what we can really control: what we say, what we do, what we think. Um, 
anything else outside of that, it's not within our control. There's so many different factors uh, that affect, you know, how things move around us. And so even up to this day, I always tell myself um, that, okay, you need to focus on this. You need to do this. Uh, you need to stop, you know, worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow. Because I still worry. I still get anxious. Uh, I still get discouraged at times. But I focus on, all right, what can I do today? And what can I focus on today to lessen that pressure? It's, it's even as simple as taking a step back. You know, taking a step back. And just relieving that pressure, whether it's at work, if if you need like 30 minutes, these are very practical things. Taking 30 minutes away from your computer just to clear your head, looking outside your window or taking a walk, uh, watering your plants. Or if you have a pet, you know, playing with your pets at home, reading a book, listening to music, listening to your favorite podcast, Um it's taking that step back because your brain and your mindset will be on override and overwhelmed if you do not take a step back. That is one thing that I learned the hard way. I, I am a perfectionist. I am the biggest and worst critique of myself. And I put a lot of pressure on myself up to this day. But how am I able to handle it? How am I able to balance it out? Is making sure I take a step back. And up to the point that I, I put it in my calendar, on my daily calendar, to ensure that you know I need to take those quick breaks to clear my mind. And then once my mind is clear, I look at the things that I can focus on today. And then you start from there, deliberate. Even those words of affirmation, it sounds like a cliche, but I still do that. I, I speak words of affirmation to myself. I even have it recorded on my phone, so I listen to it um, because it helps boost like your mind. What, when you hear things, when you read things, um, that will help you know, grow and strengthen your mind um, to get that clarity and always going back to your why, your purpose. Why are you doing this? Why are you, you know, um, why do you feel so much pressure? Why are you losing focus? Once you understand that and then you're able to identify it, then it's easier to be very deliberate with your actions. And don't make it too complicated. It's as simple as... um, uh, today I will not, uh, let's say you overthink a lot. You know, a lot of us have that crazy thing that, you know, we overthink so much and it causes so much anxiety. Um, today I will, um, whenever I start to worry, I will, you know, listen to this music or I will get some fresh air or I will make myself, uh, you know, my favorite, you know, boba tea, (laughs) something that's going to help ease the pressure in in, in your brain, in your mindset. Um, This has worked for me um, and and I still do it. I still do it today. Um, So just have like very concrete uh, and simple actions that will help adjust how you think about things. And then it strengthens your mindset. And also you need to know like what are like the basic principles of like having a growth mindset or having like that, you know, grit uh, in you. Do you have a routine that you do every day? Yes. Uh, So for the past um, three years, I mean, sometimes I do skip, uh, but more I, I do have like at least for 30 to 40 minutes I do have like my quiet time so it's a it's a time for me to um, you know just kind of breathe you know get that clarity uh, people call it sometimes meditation for me 
like I listen to um really calming like songs and then uh I read actually I don't read I listen to my audio bible it's easier for me that way um and then I start my day with just focusing on what are like the top three things that I need to do today um for some people thinking of the top three things for the day is too much so like okay for the first half of the day what are let's say the first the you know the things that i need to do let's say from 8 a.m to 12 noon what are my priorities i i pick maybe one or two and then maybe another one for the afternoon um and i and i do that and you know people during the pandemic started also to have plans and i have plans that i that i take care of some have lived some have died (laughs) but uh but having those um like having a routine really helps um a routine that i'm trying to instill is also uh like exercising that's something that i struggle with i'm so lazy so i try to like maybe you know walk in the roof deck since i live in a in 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 a, in a condominium um or just like doing a few movements <laughs> Uh, inside my 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 apartment, um, but just having those basic routines to keep you grounded and centered is very very important. That helps strengthen the mind and also strengthen your soul. And you, know, you mentioned, if, I mean, we, I, me as well. <laughs> this was my first sentence about grit. But you mentioned the you know, grit, growth mindset, which has which are two key things of scale solution. So I just wondered, you know, when did you realize that, okay, everything that I have learned, gone through, is actually something I can teach or convey to other people? When did you realize this? Mm, I guess when I started, uh, I think scale really started initially just for... Um, providing uh, soft skills training to, to students and young professionals. And um, the, the core things that I would always focus on was, you know, purpose and grit. And it kind of um, happened naturally because I'm not out here to compete with, you know, those large training companies uh, that have, you know, a lot of different soft skills training programs. I wanted to focus on what was lacking uh, and also what was needed. So coming from the private sector, uh, one of the things that I did was I also handled like, um, you know, H, uh, an HR tech, you know, company and also a recruitment company. And one of the things that I've noticed based on the data that we've gathered is a lot of companies are looking for consistency, determination, uh, innovation, um, creative thinking, and all of those are, like, that's part of growth mindset, being teachable, being able to pivot, uh, being adaptable to change. Grit is determination, consistency, right? Uh, Being able to um, pursue short and long-term goals. Um, And so they need that. And a lot of the applicants that we were seeing, um, didn't have that skill set. It's not taught in school. I mean, if there's any program that, you know, the private sector will teach it, the the students that I'm reaching out to will not have enough resources to pay for that training. So I focused on those two skill sets, um, grit and growth mindset, because it's something that I've lived, I've experienced. So I start with telling my story. So when I started um, officially running training programs, and these are free training programs, um, I always start with my story and why I'm doing what I'm doing. And then I was like, okay, this is like, this is an actual program. So I should put my story into an actual program. So there, it became the flagship uh, program for scale. So um, we train... um, uh, on grit and growth mindset, and then we have we partner with different groups to 
to help with non-cognitive skills training, whether it may be, you know, some technical skills like on, you know, data science or coding and something like that. But for us, we focus on uh, grit and growth mindset. Do you remember the 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 day where you had this idea and the first day of scale solutions? Uh, it was July twenty um, July twenty eighteen when scale become became official, but the work of scale started in twenty sixteen when. I would just uh, volunteer in different communities to teach, you know, um, young people uh, on co basic communication skills. That's how it started. It, it wasn't even called scale. It was Carla volunteering and offering to train <laughs> students um, uh, comm skills, you know, and... And a few groups started to ask me, like, you know, what company do I represent? And I was like, uh, there's no company. <laughs> um, I mean, it's just, and because I had a training background, it, it was like my way of just sort of giving back um, to communities. Uh, literally, I would just go from like different public schools uh, or like, uh, um, in different communities in the suburbs and just sending out a letter or going there and asking, you know, um, like the, the, the head teachers that um, if, would, would you be interested in, you know, for me running communication skills training for your students, you know, it's for free and it's also voluntary. Like if they want to learn more in how to speak better, uh, how to be confident in speaking in English and how to write better. Um, and I showed them my my outline or my curriculum, uh, and you know I, I'm glad that you know there were <laughs> groups who said yes to it. So, and then I started teaching some teachers. Uh, it it just came out of like you know I just wanted to do something that I knew I was good at and I can help. Um, and then in 2018, I decided to to scale, you know, full-time. Um, and that's when I also uh, established it formally. <laughs> is it a social enterprise or a non-profit? It is a social enterprise. Um, okay. I am bootstrapping it. Uh, I think like I, I decided not to be a non-profit because of practicality there's just so much paperwork um so i am like you know uh, a social enterprise but i'm a sole proprietor so um my operating name is scale solutions um so i'm bootstrapping it meaning that i do have gigs on the side uh to help uh continue what scale is doing um or i have like partners who are able to help uh, fulfill like, you know, projects. Um, I also get to have partners who want to collaborate on certain programs that we do, um, whether it's about education or climate action or human rights. Um, and I'm grateful for, you know, uh, having those uh, groups and organizations who also believe in, in what we're doing because I'm not a big company. I I think one of the things that I am very happy about is that scale is really supported by a lot of very passionate uh, volunteers who have a very big heart. Um, we rarely hire people. I don't have a full-time staff. I have interns and volunteers and maybe we hire um, like uh, people on a project basis. Um, but th that's why scale is here is because of, you know, over 150 volunteers that we've had, you know, in total since we started in 2018 officially. Um, and they were so generous in giving their time, their expertise to help us with the projects 
um, that we do. So um, for me, that's why we're still here. Um, mm. And that's why the mission of SCALE lives because of these people. And a lot of the volunteers we've had uh, came from the participants we've had in training even before 2018. So um, yeah, it's just, it's uh, like personally, it does make me happy. And sometimes it does uh, make me feel very sentimental and emotional thinking that there are people who do that. And hence, that's why I started building this concept called Bayanihan Innovation, uh, which I'm writing a book on, an ebook on. So I'll let you know once it's out. Um, yes. It's really about people coming together, um, coming from different sectors, different expertise, with just one goal, you know, with one, you know, mission, uh, which is to help, you know, the underserved. Um, whether it's about, for me, whether it's about climate, whether it's about human rights or education uh, or food security or whatever, even under the, you know, sustainable development goals, as long as it's about really achieving um like the SDG goals, because I think those are the ones that are very relevant in building a more inclusive and circular economy. Um, the Bayanihan innovation concept and, and process or methodology is something that can be replicated, that people can drive change and create a lasting impact, not just in this generation, but in the next generations to come without worrying about the resources that they have, but really thriving on and uh, working together as one, um, working and collaborating and co-creating different you know, um, solutions or ideas to, to move things forward, to address the different needs that um, we're trying to, to fulfill. And I <laughs> so 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 many questions <laughs> arising, um, but like you know, like so okay, let's let let's do it chronologically. Yeah. Um. But what motivated you, or what was the moment you told yourself, "Yes, I need to go full time on scale." Yeah. Um. Naturally, I'm a very mission oriented person, and. When I see that, um, if let's say let's say when I when I see companies or organizations use their mission as uh, just for display, that there's no action behind it, I personally get very demotivated. So I wanted to, you know, be a, a company or like you know a, a small company that would really live out the mission. I wanted to do that. I wanted to be able to apply it. And I'm seeing like, like there's just so much that people still need that I know I can help address. Um, and it's just also like an epiphany that, like I, I realized that my, like there's just so much that, that I can do. Um, there's so much that I am willing to do to address these gaps with the underserved. Like for me, underserved is not just about people. It's also like, you know, our, our planet is also underserved. We're not taking care of it. Right. Uh, so I, when, when I finally realized in 2018 that there's so much more that matters and so much more that, you know, I can do to help people and that life was not just about working and spending what you've earned, you know, just to live your life, you know, like be carefree. Life was about seeing the good you can do to help people who are in need, you know, the most. Life was about empowering the underserved, you know, uh, communities. Life is about bringing back dignity and hope to those who have lost it. Um, and that's why scale is here. It's 
you know, bringing back that hope, that dignity, empowering people, empowering communities. Because it's like, I want to be able to do this full time. I'm, I'm not here to, you know, that's why people say like, oh, you're going to start a business, but your focus is not making a profit. Um, that's like, you know, the wrong business mindset, wrong entrepreneurial mindset. Um, and I still get that today. I still get that today. And what I always tell them is that, yeah, I may not become like, you know, a millionaire or a billionaire. Um, I may not have like a huge, you know, office building. But if I'm able to help even just one person, I've, I've done my job. Um, even just one person, because that person will then eventually have an impact to another person and so on and so forth. Um, and, and I was willing to do whatever it takes to, to do this. Um, some people have this realization earlier on in their life. But with me, I think I got that realization at the perfect moment because I was mentally, physically, and emotionally prepared for it. So I was ready to take on, you know, the next phase, you know, in, in my life. So that's it in, in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> What was your purpose before scale? For me, um, my purpose was to really uh, just like in terms of work, it was I was more focused on really making sure that things are efficient, you know, that I'm able to help strategize, you know, in, in companies. I was like a, um, not like a robot, but because uh, I was a workaholic. I think up to now, I'm kind of like a workaholic. But I think like my purpose was so broad um, before scale because I was figuring out a lot of things and I was discovering a lot of things in my life. Like, oh my gosh, I didn't know I could do this. Oh my gosh, I didn't know I could do that. Like, like I had no idea that I would be in a tech company. And then my boss gave me, you know, trusted me enough to um, be an acting uh, uh, CIO in the company and had no IT background, you know. Um, and just discovering a lot of these, you know, skills and experiences that I I guess you could say I was kind of like a late bloomer because of all the detours I took um, as I was growing up, you know, uh, going through my adulting stage. Uh, I was kind of like a late bloomer. So a lot of the pieces of the puzzle in the big chunks were all over the place. Either they were sort of like forgotten or hidden And I was discovering it, you know, um, in 2018, I'm not saying that the entire, um, you know, puzzle is complete, but the fundamentals are in place. And I see now the blueprint of what my true purpose is. Um, I know that I'm supposed to really focus on underserved, you know, communities and people and really scale and empower um, people, uh, advocacies, and organizations to, to be able to have that impact and to be able to really help and empower others. So, and that's all through, you know, grit and also growth mindset. So that's how things panned out. Yeah, I really love it when you say you had the epiphany at the right time because it's uh, yeah. the time where you were fully ready to take on the challenge and and how also you say uh, you know the, the epiphany or your new purpose is just a result mm. of all these years yeah uh, exploring and it just arrived at the right time and what i always say is there is no it's never too late and never too mm. early Yes, yes, exactly. And I think it's, um, you know, 
I think that um, they people always say that uh, oh, you know, if this happens to you, if you make a mistake in your life, that's it. You know, you can't you know fulfill your dreams. You can't like mm-hmm. you know um, thrive anymore because of that mistake. Um, I think that. When a person makes a mistake, uh, it becomes like, like your purpose, uh, getting that clarity, uh, or fulfilling your destiny, um, will be like postponed but never canceled. So with me, because of the wrong turns that I took or the detours that I took, um, based on my you know uh, decisions how I navigated, you know, my life, a lot were postponed or put on hold. Um, and, but it was never canceled. And that's, and I didn't realize that on my own. Uh, my, well, my mom was one of the, you know, those people who told me about that, 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 you know, your purpose is not, you know, canceled. It's just postponed. And if I continue, you know, walking, you know, the path and just also being the center of uh, what, you know, I feel that and I know that, you know, God has called me to be whatever faith, you, uh, higher power you believe in, that if you stay the course, um, you will see things unfold in your life and scales will be removed from your eyes. And there's, there's it's always like, it's a time for everything. I know people always say that. But until you actually experience it, then you'll believe it. It's not just a saying. Um, that if I, if I like, um, if this happened, the whole scale, uh, you know, startup happened like in 2016, I think I'll be just like all over the place. I'd probably just stop and quit. Um, I wasn't, ready during that time physically mentally emotionally or spiritually even um and even you know during the pandemic there's so many uh challenges you know in in doing things and you know because of so many restrictions but with the, the the growth mindset that innovation you know in mind what you look at are the possibilities you know like, how do you, what's your strategy now? It's not what you cannot do. It's what you can do to get things done. Um, as simple as one of our big projects was Climathon. It was, it's a climate solutions ideathon. And we launched, you know, Scale brought it to the Philippines for the very first time in 2019. And it, on our third year this year, it's, a hundred percent online, same as last year. And you know, when the pandemic hit, we're like, how, "How am I gonna do this?" I mean, I have a very lean team, and how do you engage people in an ideathon, right? Like, OMG, <laughs> um, <laughs> like it was already hard in 2019. It was a face-to-face event. That how am I gonna do this remotely? But it's. It's number one, it's, you know, having the right mindset, having that grit, that determination, and knowing that you're doing this for a purpose. You're not doing it for yourself. You're not doing it for fame. You're not doing it, you know, to, to, you know, to show off, but you're doing it because you believe in what you're trying to do. So I am very passionate about climate action. Um, there's so many, you know, groups who are, you know, um, like sharing a lot of information. But I, for scale, we focus on the action itself so that these, you know, people with ideas in solving climate issues, you know, in, in a specific city or community can really see their ideas come to a reality. And and that's what that's what we did. And I'm grateful for our volunteers. We had a very lean team. Scale had a team of one, two, three, we're like four. Yeah, four. Um, and then we had our co-organizer, um, Future Proof. They had a very lean team as well, but we were able to do it, you know, thanks to also our partners, you know, for that. But um, it's just 
you know, having that kind of determination, that long-term determination that, yes, you can do it. Even if it feels like you can't anymore, you just say it. I can do this. We can do this. And it does something to you when you hear it. It really does. Yeah, I like what I say. I, said, <laughs> I really, really, really love what you say. No, I mean, because many times, especially like, you know, when you say the purpose is not canceled, it's postponed. I feel like many times we feel like we do a mistake and our life is done because it, it's when we actually cancel ourselves, our purpose, yeah. rather yeah. than the mistake or whatever is canceling it. Just we, we decide ourselves mm. to cancel it. Yeah. And you speak a lot about mindset, create, and yeah, I think it's really about okay not how to see that yeah it's the purpose is not cancelled it's just postponed uh yeah. i really love it yeah it's so interesting <laughs> no it, it's true it's true and um when i i you know i'm not perfect the long like i have my low days as well like um i uh what do you call this like i i do get like anxiety you know sometimes and um you know everyone is now aware of you know mental health and and that's real you know um regardless of who you are or what your situation is um mental health is is very important i think that's one of the most important components of really having that you know that whole well-being um uh ecosystem so it's like you can't do good. You can't like fulfill your purpose. You can't be effective if if you yourself are not taking care of your own well-being, right? Um, and a lot of these things I've heard of like years ago, but never really processed it, you know, in my mind. And until certain things happened or a situation happened, um, and that's why it's important that we, you know, listen also to to people around us. Like I, I believe that people come and go, you know, in our lives, not just for, you know, no reason, but we encounter, you know, different people in our lives because we learn something from them, whether it's something that they deliberately taught you or an experience you've had with them that will make you understand or learn something new or just give you a different perspective, then you'll be surprised how you kind of apply it or it factors into some of your decisions or how you do things in the future. Um, And growing up, I, there were things that I didn't, you know, listen to with my mom, you know, the things that she would say. But as I got older, I was like, oh, yeah, she was right. Like, oh, now I understand it, you know. Um, Mm. And it will take time. And hearing myself now say that, it's like, I'm sure that, you know, (laughs) like young people who I've spoken to today who have not haven't processed the things that I have shared with them, will then in the future say, oh, so now I understand what Carla was saying. So it's okay if you don't understand and process things right away. Don't put that pressure on yourself because in the right time, you know, it's like like you have this mind library. It will naturally unlock. That's how I see it. Like we capture so much information from the people that we interact with, the things we watch and read, everything, our experiences. But not, if we open all of them at the same time, that's going to be crazy. So it, I think that our brain naturally unlocks a few things that will directly help us or apply to our, our situation or the, the, the problem we're trying to address, whether it's in you know, your personal life or your professional life. Because there are things that I'm like, where did I learn about that? Like, and then like, oh, okay. 
that was like when this and this person you know uh shared with me or that's when 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 i screwed up <laughs> you know so there's just a lot of these things that and and they kind of like oh that's cool and then after you use it you know it goes back to the shelf but it's there in your subconscious that's what i believe so i recommend everyone to listen to this episode every year <laughs> to see what what they unlock each time no, man, it makes so much sense because definitely like and it goes back to what we were saying i think your mom must have you know learned so much when she shares with you there are things that you might understand only when you make the mistake yeah and then okay now it's anchored in yourself but you had to 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 make a mistake first to mm-hmm. really understand what it means yeah and then you'll say it to next generation but they will still need to make this mistake to understand yeah yeah that, that, that's, i you know it sounds like you know silly but i think that like there's beauty in making mistakes it's like experiments right um inventors have done so many experiments until they find the right formula or the right um uh synergy to actually make things successful and i look at my life as you know it's my experiment i try things it's a it's a trial and error and i i i think all of us are scared of making mistakes because of what the world also um you know how the world uh packaged it but i think that mistakes are one of the best ways for you to grow it's how you handle that mistake um mm. how you embrace you know uh the the learnings from there and will make you a better person uh look at steve jobs right he got like fired from his own company and then he got hired back and stuff um like look at elon musk like how many uh tests did he try with you know the space craft <laughs> to send to mars because he that's his dream he wants really to go to mars and uh, how many experiments have has has he done and um you know i'm not a parent you know but but i i think that it's important whether you're at you know you're you're a parent or you're you're the child that to to take that um pressure off when you make a mistake and not focus on the mistake but focus on what you've learned mm-hmm. um i remember one of my biggest mistakes in my career when because i chose to ignore that i was actually having like major anxiety attack which resulted to me becoming very um uh irritable um and i wasn't aware of it at all i wasn't aware of it you know um that i was going through uh anxiety and panic attacks because of a personal uh trauma and it you know i had to leave the company because it was already affecting the people that i work with and if it was it was a hard hit for me it was and a lot of people when they make these types of mistakes they don't like to talk about it but for me part of the healing process is talking about it and second is um i know what i've learned from it so when that happened to me um it was rock bottom and i couldn't find my grit <laughs> you know i couldn't find my purpose i felt like i was on ground zero um but i knew in my heart that i would get out of it you know i would rise above it it took me you know some time um i think a couple of months to just really get my bearings straight and to really accept the things that i've learned and that's why after that you know a uh, uh, event in my life I started to be more mindful of mental health. I started to read about mm-hmm. it and I started to consult, you know, um psychologists 
and you know p- mental health experts and then i started to learn that you know i was actually suffering uh, a certain kind of depression at that time um and i had no idea and and i was like looking at the different factors of it um i know that a lot of people are experiencing the same thing but they have no idea they're experiencing it um and i think that when and then what i learned about it is really being able to have a, a good support system not just for the good stuff but for the things that you go through in your life that you would rather not tell anyone you need to have a very good support system because sometimes um it may not be your family it can be maybe your best friend or a mentor it depends right but you need to have people that you can trust who will you know stand the gap and who will you know not judge you but who will listen and add value and help you go through it um so that was one of my biggest takeaways on that and that's why i have a routine that's why i make sure that i keep a balance in my life because i don't want to experience that again i don't want to have that mistake in my life again and and you know sharing this with you is i hope people really understand that um establishing a good healthy mental health is very very important so much wisdom in in this episode i feel like um yeah it's it's <laughs> no it makes so much sense now you know like um when you shared about the routine and mm-hmm. also all these you know small ways that you try to when you say having a step back to clear yeah. your mind and it yeah. can be it can just be as you mentioned listening to a piece of music or mm-hmm. like, you know just walk around yeah but that we don't even you know most people don't even have time to do that not mm-hmm. even five minutes 10 minutes a day which yeah. is which is scary yeah um so it's a good reminder that yes we can have five minutes yes 15 minutes even yes. 30 minutes one hour yes exactly a day for ourselves and it's and when we think about it it's not it's still not that much mm-hmm. it's um, yeah it's, it's it's important it's good that you reiterated that because um like if we have time to go through social media facebook instagram tiktok twitter like an hour to three hours a day even right we can have time to recover especially during the pandemic um you know people are you know in isolation you know away from family and friends it does take a toll on you know on on a person and that's why you have to be deliberate that's also part of grit you know mm. your actions are very deliberate intentional so if because if you don't make it intentional then you will just forget it so um like one of the things that i make sure that i intentionally do is as simple as making my bed every morning mm-hmm. because it's so easy to just just leave it there right i'm like oh i'm working from home so ah, you know, i'm so lazy but there's something that happens and i i compared how i felt when i wake up in the morning and i don't you know make my bed versus when i make my bed because that's the very first accomplishment you do for the day um it's when you get up you just make your bed right uh and there's just like for me there's a sense of like ooh you know it's so <laughs> fresh and clean i'm ready to sleep again tonight you know because it's all made up and it's something that i look forward to rest but if you see a bed that's like all jumbled up you don't look forward to jumping into bed and resting it's like ah uh, you know um even clutter at home it it has helped me 
keep things as organized as possible um it you know it helps clear your mind you just helps you breathe um and like today i see a lot of young people who are also having that kind of fatigue um they call it like climate fatigue uh or stress um with everything that's happening you know with the climate change and and some young some people are already shifting to anger and and that's affecting how 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 they're they're living their lives and my worry is that um people who are who are kind of like moving into that kind of mindset in that space um forget that they need to take care of themselves first mm-hmm. you know they need to like take care of what's entering their minds so that they can have a healthy mindset and they can be more effective and they feel more empowered versus helpless um i mean and that's another you know uh uh concern that scale is uh re- really working on is you know how 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 do we make sure that um the youth um who are especially experiencing this climate fatigue or stress um still move uh in love but with you know very firm grounded uh um and deliberate you know actions versus moving in anger um mm. so because those are very different things um so because it affects the mind it affects how how your message is received right um and those these are some of the things that i've also learned um personally a lot of the things that i do come from really you know personal experiences or encounters uh that i want to make sure that i do something about it and change yeah it's so 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 interesting um i i wanted to come back a bit uh before i ask you my final three question that i love to ask everyone but something you didn't mention yet uh is you also have a podcast which <laughs> you also started like in the podcast world especially in Asia a very long time ago in 2017 mm-hmm. yeah before i would say podcasts were trendy and you know uh there's a new podcast every day um but yeah like would you, would you like to share a bit about so your podcast is called a dose of intensity <laughs> yeah uh the same keywords as as a scale as your story so far with great and gross mm. mindset uh yeah. just briefly looking into it i saw that you started it was first yourself speaking yeah then you <laughs> moved to interviewing people Yes, would yeah. you like to share a bit about your podcast and maybe yeah. you know some of the uh, things you realized through mm-hmm. this podcast? Yeah. So, at those of intensity when I started in 2017, it was more of uh like I've always wanted to do a podcast, but I just really didn't know how to do it. Um until like uh, my good friend said like just go and do it. Uh and so he bought me a a mic it's a very small mic it's a it's a it's a plug in mic that you can plug into your phone or computer it's like tiny it's a micro mic um and and so it it first started with just talking about leadership you know hr and technology um and and then after that uh when when i left um the, the company i was working for um i decided to shift the you know my podcast to be more of like interviewing people to make it a bit more broad and more like not about you know just work stuff it's more about stories of people uh that have shown impact grit and growth mindset uh so and those are the people i started to interview and a lot of my guests i never met in person it was more of like 
I would reach out to them even, you know, like I'd see stories of people. I'm like, hey, that's very interesting. I want to know what they're doing. So I reach out and then I, you know, pitch, you know, uh, the interview. And then I'm glad that they did say yes. And one of the things that I really learned is that um, there's so many stories out there that are not being heard. And sometimes um, the stories that we hear are all the same. You know, whether because if it's social media, it's, you know, really monopolized or even what's on the news. And I want to make sure that the stories of other people are heard. Um, and so that's what a dose of intensity is. It's like I, unfiltered. So I don't really edit so much uh, my podcast. It's very raw um, because I want to people to feel the intensity of it. Um, sometimes I do have bloopers and I put it in the end. I think that's the only thing that I edit out, like uh, the quick introduction or like the the chats before the actual recording. But nevertheless, it's like learning and getting and really getting insights from these people. They're very humble uh, people who have their own advocacies, their own you know uh, journeys as an entrepreneur, as you know. Uh, as uh, an advocate or an activist um, and, and as a leader, it's just, for me, it's mind boggling and it's very humbling uh, to hear their stories and to be even a part of it to, for other people to hear it. Uh, it's, it's such a, an honor and a privilege. It's on break right now, but I, I will resume season four in January um because i needed to take a break because it's it's self produced so i do the editing uh even like if you notice i think um i think after my first season or se- yeah i switched like the the music already because i started composing my own song for the mm. for the podcast <laughs> so there's just a lot of experiments even happening there i learned so many things but pretty cool <laughs> Cool. Thanks so much for sharing. So yeah, it's everywhere, every podcasting platform. So uh, everyone go have a look. <laughs> yeah. Uh, stay tuned for the season four. And yeah, I can, I mean, it's so funny because I can relate so much to many things you said. Mm. And yeah, just FYI, I think I didn't mention, but yeah, me too. It's uh, very raw, so I don't edit yeah. anything. So yeah, everything you said so far will be <laughs> on the episode. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and yeah, and I can, I mean, I can really feel you. I, I meet too. It's also one, one man show. So I, I do everything. <laughs> I actually, my first eight episodes I was editing. So trying yeah. to remove, I you know, like, uh, all the silence. And then I was like, oh, it's just takes so much time of my life. I just <laughs> stop, stop editing. And, and then no one said anything. Yeah. Uh, so and it was a switch when I had my first two-hour episode. And I was like, mm-hmm. do I really want to edit this two-hour <laughs> No, I don't want to. I'll just make it ultra raw. And and, and yeah, I think people like it. I, it's, yeah. Especially if we are doing long format, then it makes even more, more sense. Yeah. Um, but cool. Yeah, thanks uh, for sharing. And uh have final three questions that i love asking so the first one is okay which i i adapt a bit from time to time but Mm -hmm. if you could uh go back in time and you can meet the carla Mm -hmm. just before you stop college yeah maybe you know one or two weeks before uh, what would you tell her anything? And if yes, what would you tell the young Carla? Um, hmm. No one has ever asked me that question. I usually ask that. Um, oh. I, never, <laughs> I never thought about, you know, what answer to give. But I, I think I would just tell my younger self that um, to hang in there, you know, like hang in there, um, uh, it's not the end of the world. Just to hang in there, yeah. And she did. 
And she did. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, and how would you like, you know, whether it's the listeners to have, you know, how would you like them to remember you? But in general, like, how do you want people to know you for and remember you for? Um, again, a question that I usually ask others. <laughs> um, uh, I think that I would want people to remember me, um, remember me as someone who generally just wanted to help. Um, and more than me, I want people to remember, um, the work that, you know, people have done through, through scale. Um, I don't think that I, I would, I don't think it would matter, um, what people think about me. I think what matters is how, you know, how things have changed in their lives. And I just want them to remember that feeling of, and the impact that, uh, whether the programs that, that we've done. So it's not just me, it's like my entire, you know, all my partners and teams. Yeah. Is, is there a, like impact story from a student or youth that have been through the skills program that you'd like to share with us? Um, yeah, so there's this uh, one um, one student who joined one of the very first programs that we did for comp skills training, and I think he was he was uh, a graduating student from college, and um, he has always wanted to work in the call center, and he wanted to uh, move abroad, uh, specifically to Canada, because that's where he believed that you know his dreams will pan out and uh, actually like all of these people who've attended our programs, sometimes, you know, we, we do try to keep in touch, but sometimes of course life happens, but uh, there are a, a number who do reach out or message us uh, once in a while. And he's one of them um, that he has, that he is already actually in, in Canada um, I think he moved there like in 2019, end of 2019. Um, he, he started to work uh, in a call center in, in here in Manila first. And then and then after like gaining a bit more of experience, he started to work on getting a job and migrating to Canada. And uh, that's like a little over a year from the time he, he attended our workshops. But I'm not saying that uh, it's we were the reason, but I think that um, feeling empowered that he can do whatever he sets his mind to. Um, I'd like to think that even just zero point zero one percent, we were able to contribute to that. So, you know, that's one of the most tangible stories that we have um, to date. That's so cool. So scale helping. So used to achieve their dreams. Hope that it's what people can uh, remember. Mm. And how will you describe yourself in three hashtags? Hashtag gritty, hashtag complicated, <laughs> hashtag uh, rebel. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think those would be my three hashtags. I think so. <laughs> Perfect. Yes, I think I could have guessed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, definitely I will have said grit. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, and yeah, final, final question. But yeah, how can, uh, you know, people either support scale solution or just, you know, reach out to you if they want to speak to you, learn from you, support you, uh, but be in touch with you? Yeah. Um, well, you can definitely reach us uh, through our social media um, on Scale Solutions on Instagram or on Facebook. Um, we also have Twitter um, at Scale uh, Philippines uh, on Facebook and at Scale uh, dash PH uh, underscore, sorry, PH uh, on Instagram. But 
if you see us on Instagram, we do have a link tree and you'll be able to see how to contact us, our email and, and whatnot. Um, even if it's direct to me, you can, you know, um, send a, a, an email inquiry on that. Um, if you want to be involved or if you just want to learn more about what we do, we're more than happy to um, be able to, you know, explain things to you or maybe collaborate with you. Perfect. I've been through this link tree. I clicked, I clicked everywhere. <laughs> uh, and one of them was another link tree. I found it interesting. <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> um yeah, so like um if if you don't mind I'd like to I like making quotes. So um like if there's one thing that I want also people to uh you know keep in top of mind is uh where will we be without hope? Restoring hope to empower underserved people and communities is a powerful thing humanity can do for each other. So um, hope is so powerful, but it's loosely used um, with, with not a lot of understanding. So um, I hope that each of you who are listening to this um, now or in the future would remember that there is hope. There's hope for you. There's hope for your family. There's hope for your, you know, your country. Um, and never lose hope. That's it. Well, it's a perfect teaser for the episode. <laughs> <laughs> is, but, is it a quote from, from you? Yeah, yeah. It's a quote for me. It's on my... It's on my Twitter account, so um, okay. I like making my own code. So when I do my my learning session, sometimes uh, a lot of it are, are like quotes that I just decide to put together myself. <laughs> cool. So yes, I think very powerful. Keep hope. Keep having mm -hmm. hope. Yep. Cool. Thank you so much, Carla. Paul. Thank you. I <laughs> uh, really love this uh, conversation. So much learnings. I think it's perfect episode to listen from time to time. Just to <laughs> process everything. Um, but yeah, I think it's nice because you put a lot of words in, you know, many thoughts I have, but mm -hmm. I might not have put some words on it. And I'm sure so many words on, on uh, people's thoughts in general. Um, but yeah, me, I don't know. What I really love is, again, when you mention your purpose is not canceled, but postponed. I think it's so powerful and, and, mm. and it's important that people realize this. And yeah. I really love all your stories, especially the one where uh, you go to the books uh, <laughs> and you just read, you hide a piece of paper <laughs> and then you're like, Okay, guys, give me this job. I'll show you. I'll show you. And you show yes. them. Well, thank you so much, Dylan, for the opportunity, you know, to share my story um, on your podcast. And uh, looking forward to having you on my podcast. Let's schedule that interview as well. Yes, yes, me too. I never <laughs> answer the question I ask. So it will be a good exercise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I will ask you those three questions too. Congrats for listening until the end of this episode. Of course, to best support Lifeline, you can share this episode to two of your friends and subscribe to the next episodes on any platform. See you next time.